morning to uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, as we continue a very serious uh, chapter here. Last week in the first 12 verses that we looked at, Jesus uh, spoke uh, very harshly and revealed five things concerning the uh, scribes and the Pharisees who had exalted themselves to a place, uh, really, uh, that they had no business in being in. They had assumed a place of authority in the church of God, and God never laid his hand upon, upon them to assume such a position. And um, this morning he's going to continue uh, his, um, really, uh, condemnation of the scribes and the Pharisees. And I've entitled my message this morning, Eight Woes. And my goodness, can we think of anything more negative to come out of the mouth of Jesus than a, than a word of condemnation and judgment? Uh, never, never would he uh, say such things as this. And, you know, as I read this this morning, uh, these, these verses that we have before us today and what we began uh, last week, I, I really can't help but going, uh, uh, it reminds me of the letters to the editor in the Boulder camera, appear in the newspapers that uh, so often would picture, uh, paint a picture of Jesus Christ as this meek and, and mild pacifist who, who simply looks the other way when some group is seeking uh, tolerance and acceptance, if you will, for, for some questionable, uh, questionable behavior in their life that they want to justify, by hoping that they'll get it to just fly across the board. And many times they'll quote Bible passages of, of how Jesus is, is the God of love and He is the gentle God. And, and indeed He is the God of love. Uh, the Bible tells us that over and over again. Uh, but the, the fact that they would say that He never spoke with such harshness, particularly about their issue, well, I think that's uh, certainly uh, stretching it a little bit. But the thing that really is interesting then, when they get on their soapbox, they will find a liberal pastor or a liberal teacher who will then condone their practices, getting someone to agree with them, to help to justify their cause. Usually, it will be about some social issue such as abortion or some deviant sexual behavior. Let me say that Jesus did speak out against sin. And if their little pet issue falls into that category, then woe be it. Woe be it upon them. Jesus did speak out against sin, and certainly I do believe that an argument can be made even from the Gospels concerning social issues such as the ones that we just mentioned. But here the issue is not social issues. Here the issue is spiritual matters. And it's against those teachers that would come alongside to condone uh, issues that really do go against the Word of God. Against those teachers who would deviate and pervert the Word of God... Um, and this is what Jesus is really condemning here in chapter 23. Men who have been given the privilege of God to speak forth His Word, of representing Him, to speak the truth in love, but who in fact have actually lost a touch with God and have abandoned His Word as the final rule of faith and practice for our lives. And they've set their own agenda and basically established their own religion. And to these, there is judgment and there is condemnation. The Bible teaches, and Michael mentioned this morning, that the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And this is what this is really about. Those who would actually profess to be within, but who are without. And those who would call themselves pastor teachers of the grace of God, but who have compromised the word of God. And to that, Jesus says, beginning in verse 13 of chapter 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and hip, uh, Pharisees, hypocrites! 
For you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it's nothing. But whoever swells, swears by the gold of the temple, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold of the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whosoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. And we're going to stop there. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Father, we do ask that you would touch our hearts, Lord. That we'd be alert. That, God, we would hear what the Spirit would say to us, Lord. Father, as we have confessed Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Lord, those who, uh, who are believers here today, Lord, Father, uh, help us, God, to walk worthy of the calling wherewith we have been called. And Lord, we know that it's impossible to do that in the energy of the flesh, Lord, but we need the power of the Holy Spirit in and upon our lives, God, that, Lord, we would walk worthy of the calling wherewith we were called, Lord. And God, that we would not misrepresent or undermine your word in our lives in any way, Lord, but that we would be obedient, God, to that which we know to be true. Your word is truth. So we bless you this morning, Lord, as you would touch our hearts. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And eight times, uh, uh, actually seven times in these eight verses, he calls the uh, scribes and the Pharisees hypocrites here. Um, he says, you have shut up the kingdom of heaven. Here's one of the reasons why. You've shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now, I found it inter interesting in studying... <clears throat> I got that little squeak in my voice today. I lost the cough, but now I've got this squeak. It's like, you know, I've... Turned 54. I thought that happened when I was 16, you know, but uh, <laughs> got this little change of the voice here. Uh, some, I found it interesting in, in studying this that some commentators um, contrast this final message of Jesus with his first public message in the Sermon on the Mount. It's inter interesting there that uh, he, he, he gives eight Beatitudes. Uh, those characteristics of the life of the believer, the citizens of God's kingdom, how they describe the true citizen of God's kingdom. And, and here there are eight outcries of anger against false teachers or those who would profess to be a part of the kingdom, but who indeed are not. And he calls them, as I said, hypocrites seven times in this series of eight woes. Now, we've shared with you that the word hypocrite literally means and describes an actor. One who is playing a part, playing a role. One who appears to be someone that they're not. Someone who is a phony. But here's the contrast. The contrast in the first beatitude, Jesus speaks of the poor in spirit, that theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. But these false teachers are, are not poor in spirit in, in any way. In fact, there's not a, a humble bone, really, in their body. They're about as proud a people as any man uh, can be. And ultimately, it's pride that keeps one from the kingdom of heaven. Ultimately, it's pride. Pride is the number one killer of mankind. You may have thought that it was cancer or some other disease that we 
read about the statistics of, of the death rate and all in, in the paper of, of cancer and some other, some other diseases. And though cancer can kill the body, pride is that which lowers the death boom upon one who would, enter, who would want to enter the kingdom, but because of pride, they will not. Because it's pride that says, it's ridiculous to think that one man could die for my sin. And it's by faith in this one man that we will enter into the kingdom of heaven. I can be and prove myself righteous on my own. And you see, this is what the Pharisees were doing. They had established, really, in their religion, a righteousness of their own. And this is what Jesus is condemning. Because pride, you see, causes one to fail to believe and to receive the grace of God, the work of God in Jesus Christ. But by their example, he says here, and by the things that they were teaching, Jesus says that not only will they not enter into the kingdom of heaven, but they are also keeping those out who would enter in. They've compromised the word of God. They've compromised it. Jesus said that you have made God's word of no effect through your traditions. And you remember that they had really this whole list of traditions that they had put on an equal basis with God's word or actually raised it even to a standard higher than God's word. And in Mark chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said that you have compromised the word of God, making your traditions of men more important than the word of God. And by the things that they taught and the things that they did, it was as if they had set the standard of righteousness for man to look to them for getting into heaven when they were actually the ones who were, as Jesus says here, standing outside the door. And when those would come who wanted to enter in, it would be as if they were the ones that shut the door by the things that they taught and by their example that they were teaching. And those who were sincerely seeking to enter in would be held back. You know, I believe that, that this actually could be the single most threat to the gospel today. Not the social issues that we can get so caught up in and preoccupy uh, so much of our, of our business today. But the false teachers that pervert the gospel, who compromise the gospel, offering a, a cheap grace, if you will, or an, an easy believe in, uh, believism, where uh, people mouth the word of faith, but really nothing ever changes in their life. They speak the words. And I believe what Jesus would be saying here is that talk is cheap. But he says here that if there's no evidence in your life, then there's something to be concerned about. It's more than just mouthing the words of faith, but it's a life that is surrendered into, be into obedience to the power of the Holy Spirit, allowing Him to make those changes in our lives. It's one thing to know you know, that there are things in our lives that need change. And, and it's another thing to come to the Lord like David did in Psalm 86 and teach me your way, he said. But when he said, Lord, teach me your way, he was surrendering his life at that time. Mold me, shape me, conform me into the image, you know, of God. Make my life different because I can't do it myself and you can't do it yourselves. None of us can make the changes in our lives to any good but it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's yielding to that one man who died upon the cross 2,000 years ago. It's believing in him and trusting in him and allowing the power of the Holy Spirit then to come upon our lives and to make those changes. But these false teachers had perverted the gospel. They didn't put their faith in a Savior or they weren't even looking to a Savior, one who would come at this particular point in time. Today, the message of the false teachers is always to compromise the gospel. It's always to compromise Jesus Christ. It's always to say that it's not just one man's way, the way of God. And believing in this one man, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, 
But it says that there's more than one way. And I can get there on my own work, by my own works, or by my own merit, undermining the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross and bowing before Him in humility and accepting the work of Christ as our very own payment for sin. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, But as we have been allowed by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but pleasing God, who tries and tests our heart. But you see, these men were not trying to please God. They wanted to please themselves. All focus was really brought up on them. John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. Why? That his life would become transparent. That Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would live his life through him. And that really should be our prayer today. I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. If he increases in my life, I'll guarantee you one thing. If, I, if he increases, I will decrease. And people will look at our lives, and they'll see the transparency of Jesus Christ, His grace, and His goodness, and His mercy, and His forgiveness in our lives. But there can be no compromise of this in any way. But there will always be compromise in the theology of the false religious system and those who embrace a false religious system. And these fellows here were no exception. And this is what Jesus was condemning. They made up the rules as they went along. They set themselves up as the standard of righteousness for entering into heaven. But you remember even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his disciples as he was speaking to them, unless or except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want to tell you, that was a startling statement at this point in time. Because these were the men who were looked upon as the righteous ones. And it was their lives, you see, it was their lives that the people wanted to emulate. It was their lives that, that the people uh, felt that they needed to be like them if they had any hope at all of entering into the kingdom of God. But this is only the beginning here. And Jesus says they will not enter the kingdom, but the worst part of it is, is they're standing in the way of others who would enter in. Simply by the things that they taught. They didn't talk or speak the truth. They didn't teach the word of God. The simple truth of the gospel why do we have to make it so complicated even today? The Word of God is simple. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. What's so difficult about that? But they had perverted the gospel, or the Word of God, and, and Jesus was condemning it. And it's strong, condemning words that He spoke here. And He spoke it in the hearing of all to expose the false teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees. Woe, verse 14, to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive the greater condemnation. Now, the second beatitude in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But once again, rather than caring for the needs and for the needy, rather than coming alongside to comfort them and to help them in a time of, of difficult need, they made false pretense, not only in in their life, in their lifestyle, but in their prayers. And they would all, oh, they would just float off with all of these flowery prayers and, and, and they would use it once again to draw attention to themselves as if they were all oh, so righteous and so holy and so spiritual. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5, concerning his ministry, when he came to the people there at Thessalonica, he said that at no time did we use flattering words, 
as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. Because you see, the true believer is clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But these men were, were actually clothed in a, in a cloak of, of covetousness. And what Jesus said here really exposed the cold-hearted and calculated motives of these guys and their selfish ambition for personal gain. No, they didn't care about the poor and the needy and the widows and those who really needed someone to come alongside them at a, at a time of need. All they wanted was for themselves. And they wanted someone to, to, to see them. And here with their false pretenses, you know, it was, it was diverting attention from the real need of the people back upon them. And they were exploiting the helpless widows who believed that these men were so spiritual. That these guys would stop at nothing to further their own lust and their own greed. That they might have fooled many. But I'll tell you one that they didn't fool. They didn't fool Jesus. And you know what? The one with false pretenses isn't going to fool him today either. The Bible tells us that all things are naked and open before the one with whom we have to do. And so we're an open book that the Lord can read. All men are an open book. And any time that there's a false pretense in anyone's life, the Lord sees right through that. They might have fooled many as to their exploitation of the weak. But Jesus said they would receive the greater condemnation. And I caution you today, because there are still those out there today who are ripping off the innocent and the weak and the needy. There are those who are putting the emphasis upon their ministry and their needs, and they cry and they weep on TV telling us that they need our money if their ministry is going to continue to go on. Really what they're doing is they're just milking people. They're milking those who are in need. Oh, they'll pray for you when they get that check. But they're out there today, folks. They're out there today. And we need to be careful. We need to be sensitive. Because even as the scribes and the Pharisees of times past, they're rip-off artists even in the name of Christianity, out there today. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, pretenders, hypocrites, phonies! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Wow, these are strong words. This is the last public message of our Lord here on earth. And he's not holding back anything at this point in time. Because these guys have had the run for a long time now. Deceptive lies. Misrepresentation of God. And Jesus is exposing their hypocrisy for who they are and what they are. And he's holding back nothing. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he's won, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. The third beatitude in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But the Pharisees were out to convert the earth to their legalistic religious system. We might think of it today as getting a feather and a cap or a notch in the Bible. But all that matters to some, and they'll go to any measure to bring in a convert, even if it means speaking lies to get people into their system. Now, the cults are very good at it today, but uh, even quote unquote Christian cults uh, will do the same thing as they compromise the gospel. But once they get the unwary, and the innocent. Because you see, they prey upon the innocent and they prey upon the, the unwary. I mean, they come on as if they really do care about some. And then when they bring them in, it's a whole other story. 
But they'll bring them in. And because they are so impressionable, because they are in need, you see, that's what I want to make clear today. There are those out there today who are so in need, that are so desirous, who so want to know the truth. If someone comes along and, you know, sprinkles their lives with just a, a little tiny bit of truth, boy, they're hungry. Folks, you're working with them today. You're living next door to them today. You're going to school with them today. People today in this day and age, and especially as as the times of the, uh, the season really come upon us, uh, the times of the end that, that uh, we see happening, now, and, I'm, and I'm not alluding to Y2K, and it's the end of the world. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying what Jesus talks to us about here even in the next chapter, the signs of the times, the days that we live in. People are concerned. People are concerned. And there's an awakening of, of, of spiritual needs in man. And the cults are out there. They've got an agenda. And they're going out there to win converts. And many times when they win these converts, as Jesus says here, because they are so impressionable and they're like, oh, wow. Yeah, they, they look at a man and they say, oh, wow, I want to be just like this guy. And, I, and, and, and they'll do anything for this guy. And all of a sudden, you know, they're doing something for this system and they're doing, they're doing something for this man. And there's a zeal that they have. They're on fire, so to speak, even more so than the one that proselytized them. You know, you could even say that's true in Christianity, though, and I've seen it so many times. When one comes to know the Lord, the true gospel, and, and, and comes to know the Lord, so often it, it is one who, uh, who has just come to the Lord that's more on fire than some of us old-timers, huh? We've been around for a long time, and we can just let the young ones go on out there, and, wow, they got that zeal and all, you know, and we just sit around and, and let them have their way at it. What happened to us? Did Jesus speak to this in the book of Revelation when he talked about losing that first love? We should just give thought to that. Many times, though, we'll, we'll see the young believers uh, you know, going, uh, going so much stronger, with so much more fury. And, and you know, what really gets me is these guys, these young, these young believers that are so on fire, and you see them going out there, there's no inhibition. They just go for it. And we sit back and say, well, you know, I don't know enough. We've been coming to church for year after year after year. I don't know enough to share, you know. Well, maybe God is saying, yield your life to me. Become that vessel, that instrument in my hand. Step out in faith and let me work in your life. There were two kinds of proselytes in those days. And one was called the proselyte of the gate. Now this guy is a guy that embraced their religious system just so far. He came so far. Uh, he accepted the basics of what they were saying, but he really didn't dive in all the way. Didn't really get hung up in all of the uh, religious ceremonies of, of, of Judaism and, and the legal uh, religious uh, rituals that were going on. And, and these guys were called the proselyte of the gate. But there were other proselytes who were so-called a proselyte of righteousness. Now these were the ones that if they could get their hand on them, oh boy, because these were the ones that would really turn uh, on fire. They went all the way. They believed these guys and they followed them without question. They were on fire and they were the converts that Jesus said were twice as much a son of hell as you yourselves. They were destined for hell. 
Now, the word hell here is not the common word of Hades, which is the general word for the abode of the departed dead. And we read uh, the Hebrew equivalent of this this morning in our psalm, the word Sheol. He, uh, Hades and Sheol would, would be equivalent words. Um, we read about Hades in, in Luke chapter 16 and the uh, in the story that Jesus told of Lazarus and, and the rich man. And that's where all of the departed dead went to Hades uh, before Christ. Uh, but this word is not the word Hades. This is the word Gehenna, the place of eternal punishment. And he says that these proselytes that are so on fire that, that have really embraced the teachings that the scribes and the Pharisees were uh, putting forth. And he says that they themselves uh, would become, as they themselves were, he said that they would be a child of eternal punishment. Gehenna is a word that was named after a valley that's southwest and outside of the city walls of Jerusalem, where in times past the wicked kings of Judah, and Judah, you know, had some good kings, and had some bad kings. When, when Israel divided, after, David di after Solomon died, and, and the nation of Israel divided into the northern and the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom had no good kings at all. But the southern kingdom of Judah had some good kings, and they had some bad kings. But when the bad kings would come into power, sometimes, such as some of these, uh, they would actually offer children as sacrifices in this valley of Hinnom or Gehenna, as it's called here. Um, when King Josiah became king of Judah, and he was a good king, he put a stop to this practice, and the valley outside then became really the city dump. And it was a place that really had all of this smoke and this stench and this fire that continually rose up. And certainly you can see the picture that Jesus is describing here of those proselytes who would then uh, turn to following the, um, the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees. He says that their fate is one of eternal hell, that they will be children of eternal punishment, children of hell, Gehenna, and all they had to do was take a walk, you know, past that city gate where the fires were burning continuously and the smoke and the stench was rising up if they needed a clearer picture of exactly what Jesus was talking about. Well, once again, how important it is for us to share the true gospel. The true gospel that we might win others to saving faith in Christ. There are those who are out there on a mission, and they have an agenda. They are speaking up, and they're very vocal. They're not speaking the truth, but they're speaking lies. We have loved ones. We have people that are close, who are dear to us. We have friends to whom they are spreading they're here, they're, they're, they're lies who have perverted the gospel. They're saying that it's good news. But as Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, unless that good news focuses in on Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed at Calvary for the forgiveness of our sin, it's not good news at all. And it's another gospel. If you're hesitant, and I don't know how you are, I mean, I really don't. I don't, I don't know how you are in, 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 in sharing your faith. I don't know whether it's something that you just like to keep to myself. But you know what? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I believe the more we share our faith, the more we are, the more confidence we have in what we do believe. And you may think that you would be inadequate in sharing your faith. You might think that that you don't have everything that you would need to testify of your love for Jesus Christ. But I don't believe that. And I also believe that if you yield yourself, 
if you'll humble yourself before the Lord and say, God, here I am, use me, send me, then I believe that he will anoint and he will empower and he will use you and you will see results in your words and in your testimonies. But I believe that we need to let God have the opportunity. Do we let God have the opportunity in our lives? You are more able than I believe you might think you are. But the real issue is, am I willing? Am I willing? God, here I am. Send me. That's the real issue. We need to be instant, in season, and out of season. We know by knowing, or because we know what the fate of those who, who would be deceived and led astray might be. As they are led through the wide gate that leads unto death. We need to be willing to allow the Lord to use us. Because you know more than you give yourself credit for. But if we don't let God have the opportunity, then, then how are we ever, how are we ever going to know? The cults are knocking on the doors. They're going around from door to door, knocking on the cults. They're peddling their false teachings and deceiving many with their lies. Let us get involved with the truth. Let us be involved by proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there are so many who are buying in to these false lies today because they are hungry for someone to care about them. They're hungry for someone to show that they really care. They really care about one's needs. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter said in his message, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But there are many today who have chosen to believe a lie rather than to receive the love of the truth that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. But we need to give people the opportunity to hear the truth of God. And you know, not only with our mouth, but with our lifestyle. We need to let people look at our lives and then let the Lord even bring them to us. And then when He does bring them to us, then open up. Open up and share the truth. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Maybe this is something that we ought to talk about on Wednesday night here one of these days pretty soon. Just how to, how to share our faith. Anyway, he goes on with his denunciation of the false teachers. Woe to you, blind guides. Now, blind guides they were. They were the self-appointed ones who were supposed to be showing the way to God to others, but they were lost themselves. They were lost and they were in desperate need, and yet they were, they were, they were claiming to be the guides, the ones who were, who were showing others the way to heaven. Paul would write in Romans chapter 2, verses 19 and 21. He said, you are so confident in the things that you do teach. You call yourselves a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of, of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who to teach another, do you not teach yourself? And so there is really the issue. They were blind guides. Jesus says they were blind guides who ever swear, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it's nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's obligated to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold of the temple or that which sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, is it nothing? It is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, He's obligated to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Now, these guys were masters just listening to this and listening to their, to their reasoning. Where they put the emphasis, 
they were masters of putting the emphasis on secondary issues rather than on the primary issues, the things that were of primary importance. They wanted everyone to think that they were so righteous and that their life was one of godliness and holiness. But their view of spiritual truth and the things of God were so very terribly distorted. Again, in the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 6 of chapter 5 of the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. But again, these weren't filled with the righteousness of God. They weren't filled with the righteousness of God. They weren't hungering for the truth of God's Word. They were satisfying themselves and their lusts and their self-indulgences and greed. Just listening to what Jesus says here, we can see how distorted and misplaced their spiritual values really were. They made the gold of the temple more important than the temple itself. They made the gold the important thing. Why? Why do you believe this was? Because earthly wealth and riches was really what they were all about. They were really about the things of this earth. They were living on such a horizontal plane that the vertical never really entered in to really their thoughts at all. They made the gift of the altar more important than the altar itself. And they put the emphasis of the oaths that they took by swearing by the gold of the temple and by the gift that they had placed upon the altar. Now, Jesus, of course, talked about in the Sermon on the Mount uh, taking oaths and how they weren't really even necessary. He just said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Jesus said, just live the truth. Just speak the truth. Just tell the truth. And he says, what else do you need? But these guys figured that it was going to substantiate their, 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 their character and their honesty and their integrity, so to speak. But Jesus says, if one is to be of honesty and integrity, a man of honesty and integrity, there's no need to swear at all to validate what you've said. And I really believe that, you know, simply by, by taking an oath, Today. I mean, you know, it is hypocrisy in a way. I mean, how much more hypocrisy do we see today than, than back then in taking oaths, than having one put his left hand on the Bible and raising his right hand and say they're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God. And I believe today, in our judicial system, and just even what we've seen played out in the newspapers around the country for the last year and a half, I believe that we've seen just the hypocrisy of a habitual liar. He's going to lie anyway. One who is not, you know, inclined to tell the truth isn't going to tell the truth, no matter what book he puts his hand upon. If he doesn't believe the words of truth in the book and surrender to the one who this book is about, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. I don't want to digress here. <laughs> But how foolish the words were, swearing by these things. Which is greater, Jesus says, the gold? Which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Which is greater, the gift or the altar upon which sanctifies the gift? By saying that if I swear by the gold, that, that oath is binding, if I swear by the gift, that oath is binding. But forget the temple. Forget the altar. <sighs> Boy, this really shows how confused these men were in spiritual matters. Their focus was so worldly and so earthly, there was nothing heavenly about their perception. 
Their religious system, now hear this, their religious system not only robbed the poor and the innocent that Jesus spoke about earlier, the widows and the helpless and those who are in need. Their religious system not only robbed these people, the poor and the innocent, but it also robbed God of His glory and His honor as He shows right here. By putting more emphasis upon the things of the world that are going to burn... The gold was going to burn. The gold in the temple, Jesus is going to say, is going to be all melted down and it's going to be, you know, the temple's going to be destroyed, but the gold's going to go. They're going to carry that off to another country. And by the way, Solomon said, you know, this temple that's built here, you know, can this temple really contain the awesomeness and the mightiness of God? But that was the place of, that was the recognized place. At that day of God's dwelling, God was robbed of His honor and of His glory just by putting more emphasis upon these things. It just showed how foolish indeed they were. To say that the oath that they took meant more if they took an oath by swearing by the gold rather than the temple or by the gift rather than by the altar itself that sanctified the gift. The temple and the altar should have placed the proper emphasis upon their heart concerning the things of God, but it didn't. They were fools. They were blind. And little did they know that the one speaking before them right now would be the one who would be the sacrifice for their sins who would be put upon the altar of the cross and who would lay his life down as the greatest gift that man could ever receive a sacrifice that God himself would make for the forgiveness of sin for all who would believe and who would come to him in faith these would be blinded and they were blinded to this. They couldn't see. They couldn't hear. They didn't know because they were very prideful. They were very prideful men. And pride would keep them from the kingdom. Do you believe this morning that Jesus Christ is the greatest gift offered to man? And that the sacrifice that he made at Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago is the greatest gift that you could receive as a human being today. By believing in Him who came to take away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. God is so gracious and so merciful. God looked down upon man's need from heaven's glory and He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but would have everlasting life. That's the simplicity of the gospel. That's the simplicity of God's Word. That Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God from before the foundations of the world. Have you received His gift that He offers to you today? Do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you received that gift of eternal life that comes through faith in believing in Him? You know, the choice is man's today. The choice is man's. God's done His part. God's done everything that's needed for our salvation. You know, we hear the words. We read the book. But you see, it's so much more important than just to read and just to hear. Jesus says, don't be just hearers of the word. James says, don't be just hearers of the word, but doers. You know, that Jesus said that the devils believe. They believe the word, but they don't believe and the God of the Word. They tremble, and yet they still won't believe. And there are men and women today who know the gospel, they've heard the gospel, they've come to church, and yet they've never really surrendered their life in full obedience to Him. The good news is that God has given man the choice. This is the the generation, the choice, the generation of choosing and choice, you know, we, we, are, we are the generation. And I thank God that He has given us, given man that opportunity. 
It's free will to believe the word, to trust in Jesus, to receive the grace of his forgiveness, and to know that your eternal destiny is set. But if you've never come into that personal relationship with God through faith in Christ, you have things to be concerned about, we preach from this pulpit. Things that you have to be concerned about. Because neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt if you walk out this door today and you cross that line into eternity that you will be in the presence of the living God today? And then on what basis? There's only one way, and that's through faith in Christ. All of the peripheral issues, they don't matter. The thing that's important is knowing what Jesus Christ did for you and believing that and accepting that and receiving that personally in your heart by faith. That's it. That's it. It's as simple as that. And yet it's so hard. There's a barrier so often that man just won't come to saving faith to receive the grace of God's free gift. It's free. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. God just says, here I am. Let me come and embrace you. But you got to come and embrace me. Let's pray. Father, as we read today, read last week, Lord, about pretenders, as we read about actors, as we read about those, Lord, who Lord would pretend to be someone that they're not. God, we, we don't want to be pretenders. And, and Lord, I pray for believers here today. Lord, I pray for every single believer who has come through the door, Lord, that, that God, this isn't a message of condemnation, but certainly, Lord, if there are things that we know, Lord, that you've been wanting to deal with in our lives and you've been pointing them out in our lives for some time now, but we've kind of like just been skating through because, well, certainly it's not as bad as what someone else is doing, but I know it's not good, and I know really in my heart it doesn't please you, but because it's not as bad as what someone else is doing, you know, I'll let it go by. But Lord, let's not let it go by. Help us, God, not to let these things go by. Lord, if we have an uncontrolled temper that's just out of hand, Lord, I pray that we bring that to the cross of Jesus Christ this morning. I pray, Lord, that we just yield, Lord, our will and our emotion God, to you, even right now, letting you, Lord, work in us, molding us, shaping us, conforming us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's a habit that that has a hold upon our life, Lord, and it's drawing us away and taking us away, Lord, and, and and we're even, Lord, not even dealing with it, Lord, like we would have years ago. But now, Lord, we've let it go on so long in our life that it's just... It's just something that we've like excused. But Lord, we know that you don't want us to excuse it and you won't excuse it, Lord, because sin will be dealt with. And I pray, Lord, that we'll bring that, Lord, to the foot of the cross even this morning and confess our sin, knowing, God, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we know as believers, God, that we do fall short of the glory of God. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for that in our lives right now, Lord, that we want to live a life, Lord, pleasing unto you. We want to walk worthy, God, of the calling wherewith we have been called. We want, Lord, our lives to shine forth, Lord, of the grace and the mercy, God, that you have extended to us, Lord. We want to be lights, Lord, that would show the lost to the way, the truth, and the life you, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray that believers here today, Lord, if there's anything, God, in our life that we're dealing with or that you've pointed out that need to be brought to the cross this morning, Lord, that we need to seek forgiveness for, Lord, I pray, Lord, today that we acknowledge those things, God, and come clean with you, Lord. Father, we do ask also, Lord, today that if any have gathered with us here this morning, We've never come into that personal and living relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, may they know the joy of salvation, Lord. May they know, God, the peace that passes all understanding. May they know, Lord, that they can be forgiven of their sin, that they have done nothing 
too great that, Lord, You cannot and will not forgive if they will come today, Lord, and ask God for forgiveness and receive the gift that You offer them through Your shed blood that was shed, Lord, 2,000 years ago at Calvary's cross, Lord, and, and flows, God, even today for the forgiveness of sin. Will you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior this morning? Will you come to Him in faith? Do you recognize and know today that you need a Savior? You want to go to heaven? Well, there's one way, and that's by going through the door who is Jesus Christ. Can I pray for you this morning? If you would receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, can I pray for you today? Just lift your hand where you're seated this morning if you would receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Is there anyone at all here this morning that's joined us? Anyone at all? Just lift your hand where you're seated. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, God, that you promised, Lord, and you ascended into heaven, that you would send to come alongside and to help us. So, Lord, may each one of us today, Lord, know that we're not out there on our own. We're not orphans, Lord. We're not out there to fend for ourselves, Lord. But, God, that you have sent your Holy Spirit to come alongside us, to teach us, to lead us, and to guide us, Lord. God, may we surrender fully and completely, Lord, unto you, even today, Lord. No questions asked. Just bowing before you, receiving, God, the fullness of your grace and your mercy upon our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.
send you? To whom would he send you? That person you're working with, to that person you go to school with, to a loved one, to a neighbor. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. Let him anoint you and empower you with his Holy Spirit. and Use you to the fullest of your potential. We haven't reached that yet, have we? God, use us. Lord, send us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Go before us now, Lord, as we go into this week, God. May our time of fellowship and communion with you, Lord, be dynamic. May it be intimate. May it be very, very, very special this week, God, as we learn, God, from you. Just re as you reveal, God, the revelation of your truth to our hearts, God. And, and Lord, may, may we just share that then, Lord. May we just be, be so excited about those things that you, you have shown us, Lord, that, that we would want to share that with others, Lord. Thank you, God, that you have revealed the truth to us, Lord, through your word. So go before us, Lord. Here I am. Send me. It's in your name we pray. Amen.